And so would you just join me? We're gonna reach our, wherever you are, just reach your hands out toward the screen to Pastor Steve. We're gonna bless him to bring today's word. We're building on a message that he shared last week, really um, getting hold of how God wants to activate us and what he has for us. And it's an exciting message, so get ready. So Lord God, I just pray for your anointing upon Steve right now to bring the word that you've been stirring in his heart all week and to release it with power to activate us, to encourage us, to inspire us to be all that you've created us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you. I'm just going to grab a stool here. This is kind of fun. Uh, Wow, it's good to see all your faces. It just makes me, it's kind of nice to, to be preaching to people rather than camera. And uh, it just makes everything real. So just as I'm preaching, please, like I said, be free to have a cup of coffee, stroke your cat, Jillian, no problem. Uh, and uh, But more than anything, just, uh, just enjoy and relax. But we want to allow the word of God just to, Touch your heart. There's so much. I'm, I'm, I'm falling in love with the Word of God again. How many of you just? It's just incredible. I'm just having this awesome time of revelation in the last week, and so I get to share a little bit about that with you today. But before we do that, can we just can we pray again, if that's okay? Father, we just surrender our hearts to you. You who do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Father, in the midst of all the challenge, I truly believe that through challenge, you have a desire to make us stronger, to make us more brilliantly glorious for you, and that we come out of difficult situations better than when we came in. And so Holy Spirit, would you allow your incredible genius, because you are the spirit of truth, to lead us into all truth. Allow that truth to renew our minds so that we're not conformed to the patterns of this world, but we can be transformed so that we will see and think, behave, act, and live, <laughs> live the way you've called us to, just as it says on, on Barbara Fraley's sweatshirt, that Christianity lifestyle. And so, Lord, we just come together today as one, as life is one on this Zoom call, to do life together with you, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, I don't know what's going on with me at the moment, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out, you know, I'm going to be preaching, and I think I know I'm going to do one thing, and the next thing I know, the Holy Spirit wakes me up the day of, like this morning, and says, hey, I've got some other things I want to show you, and you suddenly realize I've got to throw something out and put something back in. And so if I'm a, li if I'm a little bit scrambled, please forgive me. But I just, uh, I, I really want to help you understand certain things because so much of what is around us as we're looking at, um, at the media with the elections coming up and everything, we all know there's just chaos going on around us with, with the racial issues and then just the normal stuff like doing school online for our teachers or uh, doing school online for our students or, hey, does God, God have a job for me? And, and congratulations to Gabe for getting a job. Yay. OK, um, we, 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 there's so many things that are, are saying seemingly so chaotic. But the one thing that I'm beginning to realize is that where, what we behold takes a hold of us. You've heard me talk about the beholding principle before. So if you behold the chaos, all you will sense and feel is the chaos. If you behold the problem, the problem always gets bigger. And, and, I, and I've been seeing that with my clients as, the exe as an executive coach, uh, that the, because of the pandemic and economically, they're struggling in so many different ways. They don't know how to run their companies anymore because they can't predict the future. And so as a result, what ends up happening is that they, they, they behold all the issues and they get overwhelmed with the issues. I was talking with Ed Silvoso recently, and he, he said this, depression is being overwhelmed with the past, stress is being overwhelmed with the present, and anxiety is being overwhelmed with the future. And when I begin to understand some of these things, I'm looking around and I'm seeing so much stress and anxiety around me in the people that I'm talking to. And, and the Lord has been saying to me, what are you beholding? Okay. 
and 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 we know this theoretically. Can you hear this? I, and this is where I want to. We we know things theologically. We know things what the truth should be. We know that in in th- in God all things hold together. He's in control, and he's not sweating about what's going on right now. Okay. But can I tell you, I don't know about you, but sometimes I wonder, am I sure? <laughs> you know, is this, is this real? And, and so sometimes we look at the chaos around us, we, 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 we begin to see some of the opposition and some of the things that seem to be coming against us sometimes, you know, with the p- politics that's going on, who's right, who's wrong, what is fake, what is not fake. You know, uh, I'm, I'm hearing in the schools, you know, teachers are saying, I don't know if I can do this. Am I safe or not safe? Am I doing this right or not right? Students are saying, I don't like the way I'm being taught or whatever. And, and everything seems to be polarized and there seems to be a lot of opposition in the air, okay? That's why I like what Pastor Bob uh, kind of uh, called us to a few weeks ago to, to do a fast, the CGA fast, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna fast from complaining, from gossip and from accusation. And, and it's been, it's interesting that the moment we did that, it's like, we feel like all we're hearing around us is complaining, uh, accusation and, 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 and gossip. And, and all of a sudden we're, we're realizing we could enter into that, but we're choosing not to. And so at the context last week, I was at the outdoor service. I shared about the feeding of the 5,000. All right. And um, I, I've been really getting back into this. And I just, for those of you who weren't with us last week, let me just give you a very brief summary, okay? When Jesus fed the 5,000, okay? Well, I'm going to ask the question, who fed the 5,000? And traditionally, I would say the miracle was done by Jesus. But actually, if you follow the scripture, Jesus didn't do the miracle. He simply gave, put the bread to heaven, okay? And he broke it. He took the fish. And, last, and what I've realized this week as I've been studying it more in the passage of John the loaves were five small, everybody say small, okay, barley loaves, okay, and two small fish. So that goes out of my theory that he had some sort of massive French baguette that he could have or some massive tuna that he could divide, okay? He had five small barley loaves and two small fish. So imagine for a moment you're a disciple, okay, one of the 12, and he break, he lifts the, he lifts the bread to heaven, he breaks it, and he divides it and he gives it, okay, to each of his disciples. So he div- it says he divides the fish, he breaks the bread, and so you've got to divide it into 12 pieces, all right? So just for imagine how, out of those five small barley loaves and those two small fish, how big is the portion in your hand? Okay, <laughs> yes, all right, Barbara, just, 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 you could probably put both pieces in your hand, okay, and they've just divided groups of hundreds and fifties, and they're supposed to feed it with their hands. But here's the thing, in the hand right now, has the miracle taken place? No, okay? So you need to understand that the miracle was not performed by Jesus. Are you hearing me? Okay? The miracle was simply the moment the disciples went out. And I can imagine the very first person they went to, they're saying, how am I going to feed them with this? This is just barely enough to make me feel happy and, and satisfied, okay? Because I would rather have like maybe three small barley loaves and a whole fish, and that would be a satisfied meal for me, okay? You know, for those of you who kind of cut, up, cut cutting out the carbs, maybe two small uh, loaves or whatever, okay? But in that place, they, you break this little piece off and, and you put it into the first person's hand. Now, I worked out that the 5,000 people, but that's only men, Okay, 5,000 men did include the women and children. So let's just say theoretically there were 12,000 people there. Okay, so each disciple had 1,000 people to feed. Okay, and they were in that place where with those thousand, uh, with that thousand, they've divided them into groups of hundreds and fifties. All right. So the question is, how long would it take to feed that sort of group? Notice that Jesus didn't have them all stand in a line where he went individually and gave out the bread and the fish. No, he had everybody uh, grouped together. And here's the thing. He empowered, everybody say empowered, okay? He empowered the disciples to step out to do the miracle, all right? And so bit by bit, he started giving out the loaves and the fish, 
But here's the thing. I, I calculated if you have a thousand people, okay, and you had about 5,000 seconds, uh, sorry, five seconds per person to give them a piece of bread and a piece of fish, okay, that would take you probably close to two hours to feed. All right. So I'm not necessarily sure that the disciples fed every single one of their thousand. All right. I actually think the moment things started multiplying, it wasn't run out. He would say to the next person, you do it, you do it. And they would go to the next group and they would do it. And here's the thing. There are two miracles that take place. There's the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And then there's the miracle of the baskets. Okay. And so who fed the 5,000? The disciples. Okay. Who had the pieces to put in to the baskets? The people. So the miraculous was now being multiplied to the people. They all ate more than they could eat. They ate their fill. That's what the scripture says. They ate their fill and they had pieces left over. In other words, in their hands, there was a multiplication that was taking place. Am I making sense? And I want to begin to change your paradigms because so many times we start looking at the platform person to do the miracles, all right? It's interesting that Jesus, uh, when, when, he, when, when, when he, he looked at all the people and the disciples came to him and said, look, everybody's hungry. It's a long day they've been, send them away. The thing that Jesus said is, what do you have? Okay, what do you have? And this is the thing I wanna say to you today. What do you have? What is in your hands, all right? Because what is in your hands can become the miracle. All right. So I just love listening to Karen's testimony just now. And she has this little five minute video. This is what she had in her hand. She just took the little toys and she made this little cute video about her story of, or whatever. That was what was in her hand. And guess what happens? Five thousand dollars later. OK, you, you, th there is miracles that are breaking out just in what is in your hand. All right. And what you need, what you need to begin to realize is that when you begin to understand that everything that you need for, for the revival, for the redemption, for everything that you're looking for is right there, right now, where you are with you, okay? And so when I started looking at this scripture, I'm starting to realize, hold on a second, the dis Jesus divided and the disciples multiplied, okay? And I want you to get this, this whole concept of multiplication and fruitfulness for a moment. Because Jesus loved talking about fruitfulness, parable of the sower. He wants to talk about having fertile ground that's creating 60 to 100 fold. Okay. You look at the uh, five loaves and two fish. Later on, you're looking at the feeding of the 4,000 and the seven loaves. Everything is about multiplication. Everything is about fruitfulness. When Jesus talks about, I am the, uh, you are the vine and you are the branches and I am the vine, stay in the vine. And it's all about fruitfulness, all about abundance. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life in abundance. There is supposed to be something that we are experiencing. And I want to tell you something that in the midst of chaos, it is actually preparing us for incredible fruitfulness and abundance. And there is a paradigm that I want you to get today, okay? So I'm talking here, this parable of the five, keep feeding of the 5,000, it's only just, if you like, um, just the foundation of where I want to go today, all right? And so I want you to realize, Jesus is saying, what is in your hand? He says to the disciples, you feed them, okay? Disciples are going, whoa, I, we can't feed them. That'll cost like half a year's wages because they've lost sight of who they are and whose they are, okay? They lost sight of who they are and whose they are. And who you are is so much more than perhaps we realize, okay? And I want to set this a little bit more because... I'm going to give you some more context of this miracle in the midst of the beginning of, of, of Mark chapter 6 all the way to Mark chapter 8. Okay, don't worry, I'm not going to go verse by verse, otherwise you will, I will be needing to feed you later today and you'll be hungry and we'll have to do miracles. But in this process, it actually starts the story with Jesus being in his hometown in Nazareth, okay, at the beginning of Mark, Mark chapter 6. And he leaves his hometown, and we know the story. 
uh, he goes into the temple, he un unveils the scroll, and he begins to say, you know, uh, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. That's what it says in Luke 4. But then he starts doing these miracles and in the synagogue and people say, who is this guy? With such, they were first am amazed by his wisdom, okay? And then that he was, they were amazed by the miracles, but then they started questioning his background, okay? They started questioning, is this person legitimate, all right? And and if, you, if you're looking at politics today, everybody's questioning whether the candidates are legitimate, all right? And so this is just a tactic. The enemy will always intimidate. He will always question your value. He will always question whether you, quote unquote, deserve to do what you're doing. He will always question, it's like Karen just saying, I didn't deserve this. You know, I've got so many grammatical mistakes. But what you need to understand, the kingdom of God is not about deserving. The kingdom of God is about so much grace and the amazing power of grace that God wants to operate through you. And so we've got to stop getting out of that I don't deserve mindset. We've got to stop saying that I, I have nothing. I don't have anything to give. And God says, that's okay. What's in your hand? He says that to, to Moses in the back of the desert when all he had in his hand was a, was a staff. And later on, that staff was to perform incredible great signs, wonders, and miracles that we, we, we would love to see and behold today. Okay? In this place... Here is Jesus. He's in his hometown. Guess what happens? The people start opposing him, all right? So much so that they want to stone him, and they think he's blasphemous, and all he's done is he's, he's, he's trying to start a little healing ministry in his local town, okay? And so, the, uh, so he walks away, and as you walk out of Luke chapter, uh, 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 out of that whole situation where the prophet has no honor, Jesus then says, says look, my effectiveness can only be, what I'm trying to do can only be effective if I give it away, okay? Everybody say, give it away, all right? And Jesus simply says, I'm giving it away. And the next thing you see is he sends out the 12, two by two, okay? And it says, he gave them authority over impure spirits. And at the end of that, they said, they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them, all right? And so all of a sudden, Jesus is saying, hey guys, I'm going on vacation, you're doing the work, all right? I can imagine for a moment, Judas is saying, hold, uh, Peter is, uh, so Thomas is saying, I can't believe he's asking me to do this, because he doubts everything. I don't believe he's asking me to do this. Okay. Hi, Tiffany. Uh, can we mute ourselves for a moment, please, okay? And so in this place, what we begin to realize is that we are... Okay, thank you. All right, so in this place, we begin to see the disciples, they're going out, they are, they're, they're, they're doing the business, okay? But the next passage is that John the Baptist is beheaded, all right? Now, John is the most, uh, was the focal point of everything before Jesus. Now you have to realize in this moment, Jesus's ministry is only getting started. People are only beginning to hear about Jesus. John has already been established. And what happens is the head of the, the, head of the movement literally was cut off, okay? And that movement in that moment, which was all focused on John the Baptist, died in that moment. Did you hear that? because it was personality driven, all right? Everything surrounded John. Everything was around John, okay? But here Jesus starts moving and he's saying, I want to create a movement that isn't around my personality. Yes, I may be the founder, but I want to empower people, okay? If you're sitting next to somebody right now, or if you're looking on the screen, point to someone and say, people is you, okay? And so, in this, he says, I want to empower people because when I'm gone, it needs to keep moving. Are you with me? That is the beginning of what we were calling the ecclesia. Jesus was actually laying the tracks for the ecclesia. Remember what we said ecclesia is. Ecclesia is the word for church, but church not being a building, but being a, he co-opted a Roman term, which was an assembly of people with authority. Okay, so the ecclesi is people with authority bringing, and the apostles of the Roman Empire were Romanizing the world. Jesus is a, uh, commissioning us to bring the heaven to earth. 
okay? And that is the role of the people. That is the ecclesia in, in, in its, its microcosm. And so Jesus sends them out two by two. Remember, when two or three are gathered in my name, so his presence will be there. And so as he's sending them out, then John's movement, which is focused on a personality, is cut off. Its head, its, its head is cut off. The old had to die for the new to come. Okay? And the new was moving people away. What Jesus was doing was moving away from a personality-driven environment to a people driven environment who were empowered and walking in the fullness of their identity in order to bring heaven to earth. Is everybody with me so far? And so what you need to understand, Jesus, he's in his hometown, opposition, okay? So what does he do? He sends out the 12, and while the 12 are going out, John, what happens? Beheading, opposition. This, it looks like the enemy is cutting off something that was good, okay? But actually, every time there was opposition, something begins to happen. And so it takes us to the beginning of the feeding of the 5,000. And in verse 30, it says, the, this is Mark chapter 6, the apostles gather around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Okay? Okay, so what you need to begin to understand, all of a sudden, there is a multiplication. Okay? There's a, there's a growth that's taking place. And the apostles start saying, Jesus, you can't believe what happened. Demons were being cast out, okay? We, 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 we saw uh, people being healed. You know, in other passages in the Gospels, it says we saw Satan fall like lightning. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning because of all the authority that was being done and heaven invading earth through their signs, wonders, and miracles, okay? And so the interesting thing is, remember, Jesus is empowering people. And it says, then because so many people were coming out and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat. He, so he, Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now, this is where I want you to capture this, all right? In verse 32, it says, so they, okay, went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. And here it is. But many who saw them, and the word is them. It wasn't many saw Jesus. It was many saw them. All right. They saw the community, the people that had now been doing signs, wonders and miracles. And it says he saw them leaving and they recognized them. And then they ran on foot from all the towns and they got there ahead of them. So in this moment, the people had Jesus had successfully moved them away from personality driven ministry to a team, a community the ecclesia operating them, okay? And so these people went ahead because they were excited to see this, this team. It's like your favorite sports team. You know, some of the teams have a superstar, but you're excited to see your team, okay? I love what every morning on Saturday, I wake up to watch English Soccer Premiership, okay? Uh, uh, Alan loves Leicester City. That's his t -shirt. Can I see that sweatshirt again, Alan? Okay, there we go. Uh, uh, he loves... He loves, he loves Leicester City. I don't know why, but I love you too. Uh, but I like Manchester United or whatever. I like to watch my team, okay? And so there's something here, the empowerment to see a group of people operating as one, life as one together, doing signs, wonders, miracles, extraordinary things. But, everybody say but, the disciples hadn't got that picture yet, okay? So when Jesus turns to them and says, you feed the people, then they have forgotten what they had just done. They had forgotten that they had done signs, wonders, and miracles. They had forgotten the empowerment that they felt. They forgot the authority that was in them. So the question I have right now is that when the disciples returned to Jesus, had they lost their anointing? No, because the gifts of God are irrevocable, it says in Romans chapter 11. And so every gift is given to you. He's not going to take it away. The reality is they lost, they forgot they had it. They, they move from an old, they move back to the old paradigm that everything is centered around a person. Okay. And so many times we are focused on the person. And, and we the, the, what happens in the media, we, we love celebrities, right? We like to focus on the person. The world is, everybody in this, in this election is focusing on a person. They're not even asking about policies. 
okay? We, we're beginning to understand that everything is personality driven. And when everything is personality driven, actually all you do is feed people's ego, all right? And actually establish, it's really hard to stay humble, all right? But together, we're better. And so what Jesus did as, as the disciples what we're saying, we can't feed them. He's saying, oh gosh, you're not getting this. You feed them, you feed them. And then we see this miracle take place where the disciples fed them. Are you with me? And then on top of that, the people took what the disciples had and they multiplied what was in their hand. And that was the miracle of the baskets. Okay, is everyone tracking with me so far? Okay, because I want you to get this. We are gonna come out better out of this pandemic out of the coming election than when we came in, all right? As individuals and as people, as a community, if we don't come out better and stronger than people, then we've missed this opportunity that God is trying to give us to us right now. And there is a shifting of the platform. And so what happens is these 12 baskets, can I tell you, where did they get the baskets from? Remember, they were on a boat. I imagine that the boat was one of the boats of the fishermen, all right? because they were fishermen. And so we're talking about fish baskets. We're not talking about little uh, Red Riding Hood baskets, okay, where they're, where they're just these little tiny sandwiches and, a, and, 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 and some fruit or whatever and a tea cake, all right? We're talking about these massive fish baskets which are being filled with over and abundantly more fish than you can imagine, all right? And so they're getting filled with that amount of leftovers Everybody was filled. The miracles in the people's hands, okay? The miracle in the people's hand. I'm going to say that again. The miracle is in the people's hand, all right? Because they didn't realize what was being imparted to them, all right? And in this moment, when this miracle takes place, they have 12 baskets full. So what happens next? You have this amazing moment, and then Jesus is like tired, and he says, okay, guys, you go ahead. Okay, so you go ahead in the boat. I'm going to go up to the mountain to pray. And, and so the disciples get onto, this, onto, the, uh, onto the boat, and there's a strong wind. It's not the storm one. It's just a strong wind, and they're struggling. It says that they were, they were trying to row their boats, and it wasn't. They, they were having so much resistance because of the wind. And then we have this picture of Jesus walking on the water, and he's kind of looking at them going, ha, ha, ha. And, and, and as he's walking along, the disciples see him. They think they see a ghost, all right? And Jesus gets into the boat with them, and he says, take courage, it's me, I'm not a ghost, don't be afraid. And immediately the wind dies down, and they're amazed. But the scripture says this, he climbed into the boat in verse 51, but, uh, chapter 6, they climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Okay? They had not understood about the loaves. What they did not understand was that the power wasn't Jesus. The power was with them. Are you with me? They're amazed that Jesus can silence the wind and the waves. But they didn't understand that the miracle that they had, it was the miracle that they had performed. Does that make sense? And they didn't realize that the supernatural, the, the miraculous, the authority was within them. Jesus, at the beginning of Luke, uh, in Luke 6, had given them all authority. Okay? Every say all. Okay? So what does it, all authority in heaven and on earth, what does that look like? Okay? So the wind and the waves are just simply nothing when you, ha when you understand who you are and whose you are. Okay? I remember... Um, uh, a number of years ago, I was back in Canada, and um, it was probably, I think, about 2006, 2007, and we were, the ministry we had was celebrating its 50th anniversary, and all of us, we all had different, um, we all had different responsibilities to take place uh, over that year to celebrate the 50th anniversary, and for me, I had this huge worship celebration. Uh, uh, we, we had a beautiful 50-acre property. Uh, for the retreat center, which overlooked a beautiful valley with a river. And so at the edge of the top of the valley, we put up a, a, a stage, we put up uh, speakers, we put, we, and we were going to have this massive fireworks display. 
and we were going to have invite all our supporters together to have this massive celebration. And we, we, the ministry we called was called Singing Waters, so we called it Let the Waters Sing, all right? Uh, and so we were all excited, but guess what? We had all this electrical equipment, everything was going on, and this was in the middle of August, and the weather forecast was rain. And so the Friday, torrential rain all over the, uh, the Toronto area. It was pouring down, okay? I wake up in the morning and the weather forecast is rain all day in, and in our city, 20, uh, it's all day heavy rain, all right? And I'm like looking at this, I'm looking at the weather map and there's no break in the cloud over the Toronto region, not just over our city, just that whole area. And they were expecting rain for the next 72 hours, all right? And I remember just getting on my knees and I just said, Lord, I'm your son, <laughs> you're my dad, and you say we have authority over the weather. And so together, can we agree, no rain over our event today, all right? And I have to be honest with you, I didn't have the greatest faith. I just get, had the little that I had, okay? And I just said, God, you can do it. You can, you can, please, 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 okay? And I remember driving from my house towards, uh, towards the, 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 the retreat center that we had. And as I drove over on top of the hill, suddenly I saw a parting in the clouds, okay? Just a small parting and then a sunbeam shining right down on a spot, all right? And I'm looking at this going, I think that's over where our retreat center is, okay? So I get to, uh, I, I, so I'm driving, everything is raining around me, okay? And I get up and we're, we're in, because we were on a retreat center, the road getting in is a dirt road and everything was muddy, soaked, puddles, everything was there. And as soon as I turned into the parking lot, which was a dirt parking lot, in the retreat center, it was completely dry, okay? And I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at the road outside the boundary, it was raining. In the, in the parking lot, it was completely dry. And I'm looking at this going, what's going on? And the entire perimeter of our retreat center was dry, all right? We had no rain, okay? And people kept calling, is this event on or not off? And it said, is it raining where you are? And we're saying, no, it's not raining where we are. It's raining around us, but it's not raining where we are. And this little parting in the cloud stayed over us for the entire day. In fact, it was so nice because in August in Toronto, it's so hot and humid that the rain actually uh, uh, created a natural air conditioning for our 50 acres. And so it was, a be it was beautiful and the place was dry. We had uh, we had uh, several hundred people show up. We started worshiping. It was one of the most amazing days. We then had this incredible 15-minute firework display that went off into the sky. And then we put all the we packed up all the equipment. And when I finally put the last piece of equipment into the uh, trunk of my car and closed the, uh, the the trunk of my car, guess what happened? It rained. All right. And I began to realize that there is a, an authority, there is a power that is so much more than we could ask or imagine. And it's about partnering with God and partnering with who you are and whose you are to begin to see the signs, wonders, and miracles break forth. Yeah? And so I just want to keep going for a second. Because what happens after they, 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 they get out of the boat? Remember, at the beginning of the story of the 5,000, people were seeing them. But because the disciples didn't get it and their hearts were hardened, okay, it shifted the atmosphere back to the old wineskin because now it says people recognize Jesus. Because when they, when they didn't embrace the authority in them, they lost their positioning. Are you with me? They lost their positioning because they didn't walk out in what God wanted to do. And so it went back to point back to Jesus. Now, that's a good person to point back to, but it missed the point of what Jesus was trying to do. Okay. How many of you want to do what Jesus is doing? All right. What happened was the people did what was expected in the norm. They conformed to the patterns of this world. He's the authority, so we turn to the authority. Jesus, who is not conformed to the patterns of this world, is saying, no, you are the authority, and I just want to empower you. 
I just want to release you to get on and do it. And so what happens next? He comes and, and the Pharisees approach. Everybody say Pharisees. Guess what? More opposition. And so miracles are breaking out. People are getting healed at the end of chapter six. But now the Pharisees come and opposition comes again. People, you need to understand opposition is normal. Okay? So I don't want, so stop praying against opposition, but rather pray that God shapes you and strengthens you through the opposition. Nothing, no weapon formed against you can harm you as long as you stay aligned to what God is calling you to. And so I, I want to help you understand, in the future, can you believe this, but in four years' time, okay, every say four years, there's another election, okay, and it could be just as bad. I don't know, all right? But what I do know is that our call and who we are whether we have whatever election happens in four years' time or what happens in November the 3rd this year, okay, can I tell you, we don't change. We are the ecclesia. We are the ones that change the spiritual climate. We are the ones who will impact the world around us, transform the world, and help people see what heaven is like. Does that make sense? Can I tell you, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, I don't mean to be unkind, they will not bring heaven to earth, okay? They, they may be used by God, they will be uh, different ones will be, uh, you know, they come under that place of authority, but you need to understand, it's our prayers, it's how we change the spiritual climate that miracles can take place. Remember, Jesus in Nazareth, where the spiritual climate was toxic, he couldn't do the miracles he wanted to do, okay? And so, it's our responsibility as the ecclesia to change the spiritual climate. And the only way we're going to do that is if we know who we are and we know whose we are and we know what he's calling us to. We are a people movement. We are not a personality movement, okay? This church can't be driven just on Steve Trower or Bob Trower or JP, okay? Our goal is to move you away from the platform. In fact, what we've come to realize through this pandemic is the platform is shifting away from the center to the people. Okay, that's why I love the testimonies that I'm hearing, because you are the next platform, all right? And God is going to use you to platform and showcase his glory in the different areas that you are, whether you're a student in a college, whether you are going to, Gabe, whether you're going to do signs and wonders as a physician's assistant when people's not looking and you just go, in the name of Jesus, and boom, okay? Can I tell you, we're going to see signs, wonders, miracles. We're going to see in the classroom, Jillian, you just causing the storms to be still in a moment by just speaking a word and just saying, okay, everybody, be still. But you know who you, whose authority you're operating under. Now, here's the thing. You've got to keep doing it because there are going to be moments where the opposition will come and say, you can't do it. The opposition is going to come to you and say, you don't have authority. You can't do this. You know, what right do you have? All right. But you need to understand, if you know who you are and whose you are, can I tell you, Operate under the kingdom. Be kingdom people. Does that make sense? And so here there's opposition at the beginning of verse 7, of chapter 7. So what happens next? Jesus just does more miracles. He doesn't stop. But then what happens at the beginning of chapter 8, and this is kind of where I'm going to conclude, is the feeding of the 4,000. And guess what happens? Jesus says it's getting late. Disciples, okay, I want you to feed them. Now, Remember, the disciples had seen the feeding of the 5,000. So this is far less, but they forgot who they were again. Okay? And they, they can't start saying, whoa, hold on. We're a remote place. We can't get enough bread to feed these people. Okay? And so it's the same thing. Jesus says, what's in your hand? How many loaves do you have? And they said seven. And they performed the same miracles, and we know that there were um, that 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 uh, the five four thousand get fed, and there were seven baskets left over. All right, and so what happens after the miracle? More opposition. Pharisees come back. All right, and they start questioning Jesus. They they get on a boat. They end up in Dalmanuthia. Okay, and the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him, and they asked him for a sign, and it says. He sighed deeply, okay? In other words, Jesus like, oh my gosh, all right? 
And so here's what happens. And this is the story I want to finish with. They get back in the boat. All right. And the disciples are suddenly realizing, hey, guys, we've got no food. We forgot to get bread. All right. And, and we only have one loaf from an old stale loaf that we had from before on the boat. And then Jesus says this, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Okay. Now, the disciples immediately go, uh-oh, Jesus is judging us because we didn't bring any bread. Okay. And, and so it says here, they discussed with one another and said, is it because we have no bread that he's saying this? And aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, what are you talking about having no bread? In other words, guys, you're missing the point. Because they were so consumed by their circumstance, they beheld the circumstance more than they beheld who Jesus was in them. They beheld the circumstance, and they just forgot that they had just performed a miracle to feed 4,000 people. Are you with me? We need to begin to realize that we need to see ourselves for who God wants us to be and who he created us to be, rather than allow the limitation and the intimidation of the enemy to say that you, you, you are not, okay, and that you have not, all right? And Jesus says, why are you talking about bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened, okay? Everybody just say, I don't want a hard heart, okay? And it says, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves and the 4,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? Now, I want to be honest with you. I used to read this, and I, I want to be honest, I, I, I didn't understand. Okay? It's like... Uh, no, I don't get it, okay? And then this morning, the Lord just said, Steve, do you understand now? He said, you need to understand that Jesus was trying to say, do you know who you are? Do you know whose you are? And do you not understand? And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is, is like leaven, like yeast, put into the batch. It's supposed to grow things. And so he's talking about the yeast of the Pharisees, because beware of it, because they could defile a lot of things very quickly because of the authority and the position that they had. But Jesus is saying, disciples, do you not know the power, the authority that is within you? Yeast is an activation, um, how do I say it? An activation agent, are you with me? And he's saying, you are the yeast. You are the ones who are carrying the power and the authority. And you are the one who's supposed to be going into the dough of society and you are supposed to be influencing it. But while you don't understand who you are and whose you are, you will give the enemy the right to dictate the narrative of what's happening in the world. Are you with me? And so what we need to begin to realize is that, and I wanna share this with us today and I'm, I'm gonna finish here and I've been going on for a bit long, but you, have been given all power and authority. And there is a shift taking place because unless we take the mantle and we begin to start operating in who we are and whose we are, as we begin to realize the signs and wonders and miracles is not about Jesus, but it's Jesus empowering us. We are the extension of his glory. We are the manifestation of his glory here on earth. We are the bridge between heaven and earth, okay? And if we don't activate our yeast, okay, if we don't become yeast, then somebody else will, okay? And all, the, all we're seeing in the media today is who's going to take over, who's going to take over, who's going to take over. No, no, no. My friends, my family, we need to begin to realize we are the yeast. We are the people who are supposed to transform our world. We're the ones who are supposed to go in. And what is in your hand? Take the little dinosaur in your hand and make it into a video, okay? Take the, take the, uh, take the little um, computer in your hand or take the vocal gift that God has given you to sing songs or take the, 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 the people that you are influencing. And that is what God has placed in your hand, all right? 
And when he has given this to you, multiply it the, and, and just keep sowing it, keep sowing it and keep sowing it. Remember in the parable of the sower, the, the sower didn't stop sowing. Despite the hard ground, the shallow ground, the weedy ground and the fertile ground, he kept sowing and sowing and sowing and sowing. Some of it didn't bear fruit. So he stopped sowing there. He just looked for fertile ground. It, what you need to understand, you are like the sower. Keep sowing the kingdom, keep sowing the kingdom, keep sowing the kingdom. And there are going to be moments okay, where you hit the jackpot. Some of you will remember the story when I was in Skagit County. It's not too far from where Audrey and Alan are in Seattle. And the story of me going into a maximum security prison. I had just literally done all the worst, the most difficult weekend of teaching I've ever had in my life. People would stand up in the middle of my preaching and, and start saying, stop calling God Father. You know, and they would start talking. They would literally disturb me in the middle of my preaching. And the opposition was there. I would meet with their leaders and they would just say, you're here to make us vote Republican. You know, and I'm like, at the time I was from Canada and I went, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> OK, I'm just here to tell you that God loves you. And, and, and every time I would say something, there was opposition. Opposition was coming against what I was doing. And I, I, I felt like I had just gone 12 rounds with the devil. All right. And, and I remember calling my boss because she was the one who arranged this meeting. And I just said, I forgive you. I forgive you because it was that hard. All right. And on the last day, in the last moment, my friend who had hosted the conference said, would you come to this maximum security prison? And I said, who's there? And they said, they're rapists and murderers and drug dealers and abusers and all sorts of the worst people uh, in this maximum security prison. And I remember going in there. And, and I said, Lord, I can't, I, I really don't want to do any more ministry. I'm tired. I've been beaten up. And, and in the midst of all of this, all of a sudden, the Lord starts, his presence fills this place. And there's 20 odd uh, prisoners in this room. And the presence of God comes. And I, I start getting words of knowledge. I see a picture of a man's back uh, with a light shining on the neck, on the shoulders, and the lower back. And next thing you know, we have 14 to 15 prisoners responding to these words of knowledge, they don't even know if Jesus is real. They had just previously said to me that God hates them, that God can't love them because of everything that they've done. Literally, that's all they had said, negative words about their own identity. And God, the Holy Spirit comes and every single one of those prisoners get healed. Okay. Now today I've been convicted because I saw that miracle take place and I just thought it saw it as an event. I didn't see it as Barbara's sweatshirt says, as a lifestyle. I saw it as an event. And what happened after that? The following week, 42 prisoners came to Christ. The, the, the guy led 42 prisoners to Christ. A year later, 270 prisoners had come to Christ and there were signs, wonders, and miracles in that prison every, every Sunday for the, I don't know how many more years to come. It may still be happening, I don't know, okay? It was the turning point for this particular individual and he started seeing signs and wonders and miracles. What happened? We gave, had what we had in the, in the midst of all the opposition. We gave it away, and he ran with it. And then he passed it to his to these prisoners. They ran with it. They started multiplying. They started seeing signs and wonders. And I would preach and tell people about this wonderful event that took place, forgetting who I am and whose I am, and realizing that Jesus is saying to me, Steve, do you not get it yet? Do you not realize that what happened there was like the feeding of the 5,000? The little that you had, you gave away and it multiplied. I'm in this place right now where I'm saying, Lord, I want to get back to that place. I want to get back to that place where we just start realizing we're about the multiplication business. Okay, we're about seeing fruitfulness take place. We're going to see signs, wonders, miracles. But the question is, we are in a pandemic, we're locked down, but it doesn't mean you can't influence people. It doesn't mean you can't pray for people. It doesn't mean you can't take the opportunity just to stop and say, heaven, what are you doing right now? Because I believe that we are the leaven that needs to go into the dough, okay? We are the people that God is calling us to. So whether you find yourself in a, in a hospital or a doctor's uh, waiting room, okay? Take advantage of that. Whether you find yourself in a, uh, you know, just walking your little neighborhood. Take advantage of that. 
whether you're in the office, in a business, as an accountant or as an HR person, take advantage of that. Whether you have children that, that, that you're looking after and teaching, take advantage of that. Whether you're in the classroom with other students, take advantage of that. What does God want to do? What's the lifestyle? Can I tell you, we love testimonies, but don't see them as events. See them as the launching pad because God wants to take you further in the experience of his faithfulness in that area. Am I making sense? I don't know. But what I want you to know is that you take what it's in your hand. And in the coming weeks and months, all we want to do is empower you because the new platform isn't the center of what you look at. You are the new platform. The people is the new platform. And if we come out of the pandemic realizing that, no pandemic in the future will shut us down. Are you with me? Because we're not now reliant on an institution or a place because we've really understood that the ecclesia is the people. Can we pray together for a moment? Would you just uh, put your hand on your heart and just, just, Lord, I just, in this moment, I, I, I'm asking that the words that I'm speaking will be seeded into good soil. That we would begin to realize there is abundantly more than we could ask or imagine that you want to do in and through us. And sometimes we question, well, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do that. I don't have very much. I'm not very gifted. I'm not very anointed. I don't have a close relationship with you. It doesn't matter because it's not about what we deserve. It's just simply about being available. And so, Father, would you allow this ecclesia lifestyle, this bridge between heaven and earth, become a lifestyle. I just truly believe there's a reason why Barbara had that t-shirt on today, because it just kind of made it all sense to me when I saw it earlier. And Father, thank you for what you're doing and just make us into people who walk with a multiplication and take us from events to lifestyle. I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand where you are? Bless him because he's going to do more for you. There's so much more that he has for you.